What's going on, everybody? Sweet. All right. You guys ready to go home? My goodness. Oh, it's good. It's good. Hey, my name's Tyler, and I'm the new guy. Uh, kind of. Um, if I, I may have met some of you guys before uh, at Winter Chill or different things like that, um, I've been at our Cabot campus for the last five and a half years leading the student ministry out there. And then as of this month, January 2021, I am here full time and loving it. Okay. So um, I love all of fellowship campuses, but man, right now, this is my favorite. So um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Cabot's great too. Benton's awesome. Midtown, all of them are great, but I'm, I'm really, really pumped to be here. So um, I am uh, right now I'm serving as like the junior high pastor, um, but uh, Austin let me get up here tonight and, and uh, talk to you guys a little bit um, about uh, storms and these things that we go through in our life, these um, frustrating, irritating, dark times in our life. And so I, I, um, I usually kind of like to open up with a funny story or something that's um, less heavy than what I'm going to open up with, but it just seems a little bit appropriate as we're talking about the storms and I'm, as I'm introducing myself as one of the pastors here at West Little Rock, I just felt like I needed to share about like some of the storms that I've been through. And so if you wouldn't mind just um, going along with me, it may be a little bit heavy here at the beginning than I would normally do. Is that okay though? Cool. So, um, man, when I was in the seventh grade, so when I was younger than all of you, when I was in the seventh grade, I lived through my worst day ever. It was April 26th, 2003. And what I didn't know at the time was that that, that day was going to launch me into a, a, a four-year-long four season of selfish living and sinful living and different things like that for a number of different reasons. But that day, that was moving forward. But if I moved back to move up to that day, it takes me to when I was fourth grade. When I was in the fourth grade, I was um, at my dad's house. I don't know if this has ever happened to you guys, and, and if it has, I'm really sorry, but my parents got a divorce when I was like not even one years old, right? And so I never knew my parents together. They were always split, so I would go back and forth between my mom and my dad's house. But when I was in the fourth grade, I was downstairs at my dad's house and um, doing my things, doing whatever fourth graders do. And I um, heard like this loud thump happen upstairs. It sounded like a bowling ball was dropped on the floor. And normally in, you know, fourth grade Tyler's life, I wouldn't necessarily go and see what happened. But today there was something inside of me that told me to go upstairs. So I walked upstairs and I found my dad um, he had, he had um, passed out onto the floor and he was having a seizure. And at the time I went up and I was trying to shake him, dad, 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 what's going on? What are you doing? And couldn't get him to respond to me. So I, um, I then uh, call, uh, I did the only thing that I knew how to do. I went to call 911, 911, the ambulance comes, they get him, um, that whole thing. And what we found out is my dad had an aneurysm rupture on the left side of his brain. And what that means is that there was a weak blood vessel that broke or popped and he was having a brain bleed. That's what was causing the seizure. And through many, many days in the hospital, hospital and brain surgery and all of that, it rendered him, um, because it was on his left side of his brain, he was paralyzed on his right side. And so my baseball dad coach could no longer coach baseball. He could no longer walk around very easily. He could no longer drive. He could no longer work. And so what happened is my dad um, was living this way, couldn't do anything. So he was really staying in the bed a ton and really doing his best as a dad. But there's only so much that you can do when only half of your body works. And then, so he was married to my stepmom. Um, and one night she, um, uh, she decided that she was going to go to a bar and get just hammered. I mean, slozzled, okay? And so she comes back in the middle of the night when me and my sister are sleeping. Um, we can hear her screaming at my dad, all of these different things, cussing and all of that. And eventually she runs upstairs, opens up our doors and says, you're no longer welcome here and kicks, you know, me and my sister out of my dad's house. And we never went back. And so when I was in the seventh grade, brings me to this day, April 26th, my dad had another aneurysm rupture in his brain and he passed away. And so here I am, 
seventh grade Tyler. I'm like four foot nothing. I'm really small. I really don't have a ton of friends. And now my dad passes away. And what I didn't know at the time, I really wasn't asking a whole lot of questions. I wasn't really mad. But what I began to do is to mask my pain with the selfish living that I talked about. And I tell you that story for a couple of reasons. One, because I want you to know where I'm coming from. That I've, I've been through some stuff. I've been through some storms in my life and, and maybe your storms that you've been through in your life look kind of like mine. Maybe you've lost some friends or family members or maybe even a parent. Or, or maybe, um, maybe, you're, maybe the storms that you've been in have been a little different because we're all going, we've all been through storms. Maybe your storm is, maybe you have something internal or external that's happening to you. Maybe you've got this internal depression or anxiety that you just can't control and it feels out, like your life totally feels chaotic. Or maybe there's something external that has happened to you or is currently happening to you. A relationship is strained. You... Um, a boyfriend, girlfriend, something like that. Maybe a friend turned their back on you. Maybe it's family stuff. I don't know what it is, but there, there's just, um, there's this universal thing that we all go through called suffering and we all go through storms and they all look different in different times in our life, but we can all nod our head in the same direction about, yes, I've been through something like that. If we went to coffee tomorrow and, and I just said, man, tell me about your worst day ever probably wouldn't have a hard time trying to think of it. Maybe a couple of things come to your mind, but you probably wouldn't have a hard time dreaming up or thinking about the worst day ever or maybe even the worst season ever that you have been in. And the reality is, is that when we get into those moments, sometimes we're just so numb from the pain or we're so frustrated about the pain or something like that. But sometimes we, like, we're like, God, where are you in this? Like, what are you even doing? Like, what is happening? And it actually leads us sometimes to this question. This question of why. Why is this happening to me? Now, I'm just going to be honest, going to give you my opinion. A lot of people discourage young people from asking the why question. Oh, don't ask God why. You're probably never going to know. I think that's a bunch of garbage. Because I, I, I just, I think the reality is like when we look at scripture, we, when we ask the why question, when we ask God, why is this happening? He's not burdened by that. He's not irritated by that. In fact, we find ourselves in really good company with King David, who in Psalm 22 opens it up and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or even more so, we find ourselves in good company with Jesus who when he was on the cross asked the same question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I don't wanna discourage you from asking the why question at all because I don't wanna discourage you from living the way that Jesus did. In fact, I think this series, Storms, is even kind of anchored in this idea or this question of why. Because we want to we want to gain some perspective. We want to see beyond where we are in our current situation. And so tonight we're going to look at another reason how, or we're going to look at another way as to how God uses storms in our life. And we're going to look at a little bit of a case study from the book of Exodus and this group of people known as the Israelites. Now, you, you may know about this group of people, but if you don't, don't worry, because I'm going to tell you about them. Um, hopefully, maybe this will be a refresher or maybe this will be new information. Regardless, we're going to talk about them because they're really an important people and understanding who they are in their history tells us a lot about how God interacts with his people. So Israelites, they are known as God's chosen people. God's chosen people. And he moves them to this land called Egypt. And, and really what we see in Exodus chapter one are the, Isra the Israelites are doing just unbelievable, just better than most people groups. I mean, they are just really, really doing it. Because this is what it says. Exodus chapter one, verse seven goes like this. It says, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. Okay, like they're really doing good. They multiplied greatly. They increased in number and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So there's a lot of them. 
They're doing what God called us to do in Genesis chapter one, be fruitful and multiply. So they're doing, like they're living into the way that God has called them to live. And everything is awesome until it's not, okay? So this is, this is what happens next. It says, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came into power in Egypt. And he said, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. In other words, they're doing too good. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will be even more numerous. And if war breaks out, um, they, will be, they will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So now they hatch a plan. So they're, Israelites are doing great. The king of Pharaoh is like, we can't have that anymore. So like, we've got to do something to, to fix this issue of the Israelites. And so this is what they come up with. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. So what we see are the Israelites doing unbelievable, doing wonderful, doing great, doing what God called them to do. And then people in the culture that they are living in get frustrated with them. So they're like, we've got to fix this issue of the Israelites. And so they begin to deal shrewdly with them. They put them into slavery. And as we go through the Israelite story, we also see that they actually kill their children. Like, this isn't just like a, like, man, <laughs> they're being made fun of or, no, like, this is like a really bad deal. And it's not like it's a season. It's not like this happens just for a couple of years. What we learn later in Exodus is that the Israelites are in Egypt for 430 years. They are in this season of, of, of slavery and of oppression for, a lo- for generation after generation after generation after generation. This is some people's entire lifetime here on planet Earth. They were living in oppression under the Egyptians. 430 years. It's a long time. To put that even into perspective, the United States isn't even 400 years old. It's not even 300 years old. The United States is 244 years old. So like, the, like that even, that number 430, like that is even beyond what we can comprehend in our current mind, I think, sometimes. But God hears their cries. God looks down on earth and he sees his people being oppressed. He sees the issues that they are in and he says, I'm gonna do something about it. So he raises up a guy named Moses. And you may have heard of Moses before. And Moses is charged to go to Pharaoh and say, let God's people go now. And Pharaoh is like, it's not gonna happen. And Moses is like, listen, God says he's gonna send plagues on this land if you do not let my people go. So he gives him a couple of uh, times. He's very gracious in his time. He says, hey, come on, let, let God's people go. And he's like, I'm not gonna do it. And so what happens is all these different plagues begin to come. And maybe you've heard about them before. There's frogs and locusts and their livestock dies. And then they get boils all over their body. They turn their water source, the Nile River, into blood. And all of this stuff is happening. It's really even interesting, though. um, There's one plague that's the plague of darkness. And it says that it lasts for three days. But God, in his graciousness to his people, protects them from all of the plagues. Because it even says wherever the Egyptians were, it was dark. But where the Israelites were, it was light. But maybe put yourself into the mindset of an Israelite just for a moment. What happens, and something I neglected to tell you, is first when we see the the, the Israelites under the oppression of the Egyptians. And then when Moses goes to Pharaoh, he's going back and forth. And Pharaoh gets even more ticked off that he was like, hey, listen, I'm going to make your job even more difficult. So he oppresses them even more, makes their jobs even harder, even more difficult. And so they're dealing with even more oppression. And so they've already been in slavery for years and years and years. It's all that they've known. It gets even worse. And now all of these different plagues are happening around them. There's a hailstorm that has thunder and lightning and fire in it. Have you ever been in a firestorm? Holy moly, right? Like that's like crazy, okay? Like all of this stuff is happening around the Israelites. And so really we find them even in more oppression and totally surrounded by chaos and there's nothing that they can do about it. 
sometimes I just think that's what life is like, right? It's like where things are happening in and around us and we're fresh, we feel oppressed. We have these internal, external things that are going on. There's all of this storm that is brewing around us and it honestly leads us to a question that's like, God, are you even good? Like, let's just be honest for a second, can we? Whether we follow Jesus or not, Sometimes we, we ask the question, God, are you, are you good? God, are you loving? God, are you kind? So from the way that it looks down here, it doesn't look like you're very much involved in what is going on. Like, do you even care? Have you forsaken us? What in the world is happening, God? But the truth is, is that God is good. And God's very essence is love. And God is kind. And I, and I don't just say that because I'm a pastor <laughs> or it's like the good Christian thing to say. Yeah, God is love. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good, right? No, I, I say that because as I, as I see God's character throughout Scripture, he is consistently good. And God is consistently kind. And God is consistently Loving. I, I think sometimes, and maybe this is you, maybe it isn't, but I think sometimes we see there are two different gods in the Bible. We see that there is the God, we think there's a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is this old curmudgeon dude that's just irritated and he's just like full of wrath and anger and just wants to punch people in the nose. And then the God of the New Testament is like this loving, kind, dandelion guy. You know, like, it's like, we see these two different gods, but the reality is, is that God from the beginning of time has been consistently good and he's been consistently kind and he's been consistently loving. And we see that even in the story of the Israelites because I mean, they are dealing with this unbelievable storm, this season, this horrible time of oppression and all of these plagues that are going around them. But God makes true on his promises. And we see all like the culmination of this even in Exodus 14, or at least a part of this is this was what it says. They finally get through all of the plagues and Pharaoh releases them and they're on their way. But then they come to the edge of the Red Sea and it's like, well, shoot, we have nowhere to go. The Egyptian army is right behind us and we need to be over there, but there's a big body of water. Anybody bring a boat? No, we didn't bring a boat. Oh, what are we going to do? Well, God provides a way. It says this, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the water uh, and uh, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. God makes true on his promises that he was going to redeem his people. But what it took for the Israelites to go through this storm for God to rescue them. Do you guys see that? They had to go through a storm of the plagues and the storm of oppression for God to rescue them. Here is the reality. Sometimes... Sometimes God uses storms to rescue us. Sometimes God uses storms. The storms in our life, the frustrating seasons, the hurtful seasons, the painful seasons, God uses those storms in our life to rescue us. It's been 18 years since my dad passed away. 18 years. I've lived longer without my dad than I did with him. And as I reflect back over that time, the reality is, 
is that God used that storm in my life, in that seventh grade Tyler's life, to rescue me from my family history. What do I mean? There has been very few, and I mean very few marriages in my family history that have not ended in divorce. 99% of my family's in most recent history, in the last 100 years of my family or family of origin, my family, 99% of them have ended in divorce. Almost every person in my family have not had marriages that have lasted their entire life. There, my great-grandmother was married seven times. One time she was married for a week. You wanna know why it was only a week? Because he died in a bar fight. Like, come on, like, that is crazy, okay? That's my, that's my family history. We have, I have a history of men abusing their wives, hurting their kids. I've got, like, I, I, all of those things, cheating on their wives, being deadbeat dads, and God used the storm in my life as a seventh grader to point me to, like, this idea that, hey, you don't want to be like them, do you? You don't want to be like your family history. And students, I stand here today 18 years after that storm in my life. And yes, I'm still sad sometimes. Yes, I miss my dad sometimes. But the reality is, is that the storm that I went through has rescued me from any kind of behavior of being a deadbeat dad or or being an abusive husband because I don't want that. It's also made me really enjoy the time that I have in the moment because honestly, I don't know how much time I have. None of us do. My dad died when he was like 52, 53. I, I don't know if that's when I'm gonna go. I hope not, but it, the reality, I, don't want, I don't want my son Brooks to, to um, remember his dad as some deadbeat dad. I don't want him to see me and his mom constantly fighting or arguing with me, cheating on her, her cheating on me. I don't want any part of that. And if it took that storm in my life as a seventh grader, then let it be because it rescued me from behavior that I didn't want to be. Students, sometimes the storm we are in is God, it will, God will use it to rescue us from behavior that we don't want to be in. Are you guys seeing what I'm saying? Sometimes God uses these storms to rescue us from the things that we don't want to be so that we can live into God's absolute best for us. But here's the really tricky part about this principle is that you will not be able to see what God is rescuing you from in the middle of that storm you will not be able to see what God is rescuing you from in the middle of that storm. If you had come to seventh grade Tyler and said, oh man, and it's really, it's really sucky that your dad died, huh? You know what? You're gonna be a better dad because of it. I don't even, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, I, don't even, I wouldn't even have that narrative in my mind. I do now because I can look back in hindsight. But if you had told me then, I would have no clue. It's kind of like this. Um, back a while, like in 2008, 2009, um, me and my best good buddy Mitchell, we, uh, were, at a, we were a part of a church in Maumelle. And um, we were serving there in the student ministry. And we were um, in college, we were serving. And all of it, it was our home church and all of that. And we heard about this new church that was opening up a brand new building and we wanted to go check it out. It was really cool. They had three venues on Sunday morning. They had this like traditional service, which was fine. They had this kind of blended service that met in the worship center. And then this really cool service known as the Edge. It was in the warehouse. And we were like, oh, that's awesome. And so in 2008, 2009, just as soon as this building opened, we walked in here to see it and to check it out. And we came to service here. We never came back because we had our own church home. But if somebody had come up to me when I was visiting Fellowship Bible Church in 2008, 2009, and you had told me, hey, you're going to work there one day. I, I wouldn't even been, have, I, I, that's just not even a thing that I would have been, um, like I couldn't have the imagination for that. 
And sometimes when we are in the middle of our storm or a storm in our life, we can't have the imagination. We can't have the, the narrative. We don't have the forethought. We don't have the brain capacity to see how God is going to use it. I'm just telling you, sometimes, sometimes God uses these storms in our life to rescue us from something. And you're not going to be able to see it in the middle of the storm. You're going to have to get through that storm to see where God was going to rescue you from. And sometimes that brings us comfort to know, okay, God is doing something in the middle of this. God is going to use this. And I want you to know that. I want you to remember that. But, but I also want to leave you tonight with a couple of promises that when, if you are right now in the middle of the storm, in the middle of something that's really hard. I just want to leave you with three promises that are grounded in Scripture that will help you get through those storms so that you can get on the other side of the storm to see what God has done in the storm and in you. And the first one is this, is that God is always near you, especially in suffering. God is always near you, but especially in in suffering. See, here's the thing, students. God didn't start the world, spin it into creation, put it into orbit, and then walk away. No, he has been very much involved from the beginning. He is here dwelling among us right now. And so God is near you, but there's something about us going through pain or hurt or suffering where God just is closer. God is just nearer. And we find this this truth anchored in scripture in, in Psalm 34, it says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. God is close to the brokenhearted and he's near those who are crushed in spirit. So if you are brokenhearted, you're in the middle of the storm, your spirit is utterly crushed. You can know that God is with you. The second promise that I want you to know when you're in the middle of the storm is that God will make all things right. Sometimes we feel like it's our job to make all things right and sometimes God uses us to bring rightness into the world. But ultimately it is not our job to make things right. Sometimes God uses us, but it's not our ultimate job. So if there are things that have happened to you there's been people that have hurt you. There's been situations that have hurt you, systems that have hurt you. You may not be able to change it this side of eternity, but I'm just telling you, God will make all things right. It is not our job to make it right. It says this in Romans 12. It says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. If you are following Jesus, you can know that you have a God who is going to make all things right. And those people or those systems that have hurt you, then they will pay for their actions. There will be ultimate justice that comes from God the Father and he will not let just injustice reign. No, he will bring justice to the world and one day he will make all things right. And so in the middle of your suffering, in the middle of your pain and you can't do anything about it, you can know God is near you and you can also know that God will make it right one day. And the last promise that I want you to hear tonight is that God will make all things new. There's going to be a day that, that there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more hurt. But God will bring freshness and newness and bring life into the world that hasn't been here. It says this in Revelation. It says, and he who was seated on the throne, he says this, Behold, I am making all things new. So, God sometimes uses storms to rescue us, but we're not going to be able to see what he's rescuing us from in the middle of that storm. We're only going to be able to see it when we're through the storm. But we're in the middle of the storm. I want you to remember that God is near you, especially in suffering. 
God will make all things right. And God will make all things new. So the band's going to come back up here. And we're going to do something a little different tonight. We're going we're gonna to just have a song of reflection. And this song is super vibey. It's beautiful lyrics. But as, um, as they sing this song, I just want them to, to sing it over us in the room. But I want you to, I want you to think about two, one of two questions. I want you to think about one of two questions as we are like just reflecting in this moment. And the first question is this. If God sees fit to use chaos and storms to rescue us, what would trusting him in the middle of that look like? What would trust look like for you? In the middle of right where you are, in the middle of the storm that you are in, what would trust look like? So you can reflect on that question or this question. What of God's promises do you need to hold on to today? Of those three promises that I shared with you just a few moments ago, which one of those promises do you need the most today? Do you need to know that God is near you, especially in your suffering? Do you need to know that God will make all things right? Do you need to know that God will make all things new? So, so we just take a few moments here. I'm just going to ask that you put your distractions away. If you've got your phone out, just put it down for a moment. If you've got some sort of drink or something to eat with you, just put it down for a moment. And let's just spend the next four or so minutes Resting in God's presence, thinking about, man, what does trust look like right now in the middle of my storm? Or what promise do I need to hold on to right now? So let's just go before the Lord. Let's close our eyes together. God, you've not forsaken us, but actually your character is good. Your character is kind. You are loving. God, meet with us here in this moment. God, we love you.